So, um, so Brent, Jeff, <laughs> tell me, uh, tell me your backstory as to uh, how how you end up where you are right now, and uh, like what was the yeah, what was the origin there? Well, how was, how do we end up? I was teaching at the Moraga Country Club. Uh, I got the job there in 1978, and you know back then the 70s anyone could basically get hired. I mean, the sport was just taking off. It was getting super popular. And I had, you know, I played enough tennis where I could look okay hitting a tennis ball. And I knew all the different teaching cliches because I had taught a little bit before, you know, standard turn, racket back, hit out in front and follow through. That was my idea of being a tennis professional. Um, did I enter, did I know anything about, about, uh, strategy or tactics? No. I had the one commodity then that uh, everyone kind of did when I was 30 years old. I could I could still run around. I could just move around like a little rabbit and kind of dink balls back. And even uh, George Mays once commented on my serve. He said, I can't hear it. I don't hear anything. <laughs> Sorry, did I laugh? Uh, uh, no. <laughs> I said, really? He said, no, man, there's just no sound on it. So... Um, not only was I a lousy tennis pro, as the head pro and the tennis and, 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 and the tennis director of the Moraga Country Club, which in the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area, is a plum job. Right. Uh, I didn't know how to teach, didn't know how to coach, and I didn't really know how to play. I mean, I really wasn't a player, right? I mean, I'd, I was kind of at the, back then, we didn't have the NTRP, so there was A, B, C. Right. There might have been D. I was right in the middle of the B pack. You know, so I wasn't great. So I'd been there for about a year and I hired my first assistant pro, Doug King. And Kinger had played at Cal Berkeley, played number one at Cal, was a really good right. player. He played a little bit on the tour. After, after a couple of years, he decided, you know, he really, that wasn't what he wanted to do with his life. He came home and started looking to teach. And uh, he, he and I were good friends from the, from the, uh, from the Berkeley Tennis Club. So I hired him. And Moraga Country Club, they had these two teaching courts, courts 11 and 12. They were side by side, kind of separated from the other courts by themselves. And I've been, like I said, I've been teaching there for maybe a year or so. And so I'm teaching my group, all my groups on my court. I'm on 11, he's on court 12, and he's teaching his. And, and I'm hearing the stuff coming from him that is like nothing I've ever heard before. It's not the, uh, okay, uh, uh, Mrs. Jones, turn, rack it back, step forward, hit out in front, and follow through. It was different. It was a totally different language. And, and when I really kind of went, wow, um, I don't know what I'm doing, was when about three weeks into him being there, my ladies, my, my group of players had not improved a lick, and his... <laughs> We're already a different level. And um, so that's when I went to him and I said, Kinger, come on, man. Where'd you get this stuff? That's a, that's a great that's a great moment, though, to have uh, to be to humble yourself. You know what I mean? To have that recognition, the, that little aha moment and and, you know, go there. Yeah, um, that's yeah. pretty cool. So. um so what was your what was your hope? What did you hope to accomplish? Uh, you know, in that process. Well, I gotta I gotta be honest. I was it was more selfish than it was uh, altruistic. Uh, <laughs> in terms of, I, I just want to become a better player. You know that 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 was my right. first thing. I was, I really wanted to become a better tennis player in terms of where I was, the kind of the middle of the B pack. And I really at the time we were hosting in August every year which is now the old stead, is now the heritage right. uh, Moraga Country Club. But it, but originally it was the men's and women's open Northern California sectional tournament. Yeah, it was, it was a big deal. It was a big I mean, tournament. Big and, deal. Uh, you know, I was a tournament director and I loved doing that. But what I realized is that I was nowhere near the player that these other guys were. And they just looked so cool out there. I mean, <laughs> they were just all so smooth and they hit the ball great. And, they, you know, they look good and they were all in shape and the collars on the Fred Perry stuff and the Kimmy yeah. Foucault were all up. And I just got, God, I want to be one of those guys, right? Right. I want to I want to be a better player. But 
But internally, I sort of had this sense that I want that, I want that social status in my life. I want to be able to go out right. there and sort of tell people, yeah, you know, I'm one of the fellas. Right. I'm, I'm one of the I'm one of the cool guys. I mean, here I'm 30 years old. I mean, if you haven't figured it out by then, which I obviously had not. <laughs> um, but that was really sort of my two things. You know, externally, yeah. externally, I wanted to have a number. I wanted to play at a higher level, um, but internally, I think it was more. Gosh, um, I just want that status. Yeah, I and it, I think status. you know, and tennis is a really interesting endeavor. Um, no matter what level you're playing at, um, because it does, it exposes us. We we stand there out on a tennis court, and you know, um, it's a big space. It's a big, empty space, and it's really easy to see the players on it, <laughs> on the stage, right. because there's not there's not a crowd there, right? And so, I think you know that that stage brings out certain aspects of our personality without even thinking about it. You know, it just it just creates these things, and all of a sudden you start learning things about yourself, and you either ignore them and push them down in a way, <laughs> and continue to conduct yourself in a certain manner, right. or you have your moment and you decide, hey, you know what? I think there's something more here besides, yes, I want to be a better player. But what's that little thing inside that, you know, that says, hey, I want to be, I want to be one of the guys. <laughs> you know? it's, 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 not, it's not too I, far-fetched. Yeah. And, and you know, the other, the other, you know, aspect is, you know, I want to be one of the guys that, that, that there's a box of stuff that shows up from the sponsors and stuff. And, and wow, I got a box of clothes with the big label on it. You know, that was always the big. <laughs> you know. Right, right. Um, so, uh, so, so was there a, was there a problem in that journey that once you did, you came to Doug, you asked him, you know, how, you know, well, what's your secret? Yeah, uh, what's no, your... I mean, I, I had sort of up, up to that point, uh, I was the classic do it yourselfer. I mean, I really hadn't I hadn't taken any lessons from anyone, you know. I mean, and, and I had a, I had a very tiny junior career one summer playing a few tournaments, and I that was terrible. Um, so I really hadn't taken any lessons. I was just typically just kind of going by the seat of my pants trying to figure out the game, and obviously I'd been stuck at kind of right in the middle of the B level. And, and so I just kind of went to him and I sort of had this thing, well, where are you getting all this stuff? Because you're, you, you sound different. The language is different. Obviously your ladies are way better than mine over here. I get that. <laughs> where are you getting this stuff? And, and, uh, he said, Tom Stowe. And, and so I said, well, you know, tell me more about the, the, the Tom Stowe thing. And he said, well, he said, you've, you've probably noticed I'm not here on Wednesday mornings. That's kind of, um, you know, my, my half day off is Wednesday mornings. And I said, yeah, I, I did kind of notice that. And I said, uh, <laughs> he said, well, I go up to Napa and I'm in a group of three guys up there. Um, it's myself and Steve Stefanke and John Hubble. And those three guys were within the top five ranked players in NorCal. And I'm thinking, right. I'm thinking, um, God, that, is there a way? Is there a way that I can somehow... <laughs> how do and, I weasel my way in there? How do I weasel? I said, but why would they want me in there? These guys are all the top five guys in NorCal, and I'm right. like, like 182. <laughs> what am I going to contribute to the group? So... Um, I actually called up Mr. Stowe and I knew him a little bit from the Berkeley Tennis Club when I, when I was a kid. So it wasn't right. a total cold call, but I've never, I'd never taken lessons from him. Right. And I called him up and I just, I just said, you know, I really want to learn how to play. Uh, and I know, you know, Doug's my assistant here. I know, you know, Doug's a good friend of mine and I, you know, pretty good friends with Steve Stefanke and John Hubble because of the, of the tournaments that they play, and I know those guys pretty well. Uh, is there any way that I might be able to join the group Wednesday mornings? 
and there's this silence and and you know you know mr stell he was <laughs> he was not the most ooey gooey human in the world out there yeah he was a yeah. little rough around the edges and especially then that was in 1981 and 81 he he was just a couple of years away from passing away right and he was sick i mean he was not not in great health so for him it was kind of like oh, do i want to take on another project and he, right. he was trying to find ways to kind of <clears throat> kind of be able to say no I don't want you first thing was how old are you and <laughs> at the time I was 30 I guess 32 or 33 and I thought god if I tell him I'm 32 or 33 he's gonna go he's gonna go man you're 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 you're, you're so far past your prime <laughs> you don't want to come up here and he said and he said so I just lied to him I just I said yeah, uh, Mr. Stowe, uh, you know, 27, you know, uh, 27. He said, 27? And I said, yeah, uh, yes, sir. And he, and, and he goes, uh, he goes, well, because, okay, if you want to come up here, because if you want to come up here, not to learn how to play, but just learn how to teach, then I'd have to charge you a whole lot more. <laughs> and I said, oh, I, I, I completely accept that. And he says, all right. You can come up next Wednesday. Don't be late. Be here at nine o'clock, and uh, and we'll go for three hours. So, so that was my plan. Was I sort of weaseled my way into that group? I got lucky, and <laughs> and I got up there. And the other three guys you know, were fine. They didn't really, you know, we we had it was at a junior high school up there. Was it Justin Sienna or what's that? Yeah, yeah. So it was that it was that junior high school up there, and and. Uh, and the school would let Tom come out and teach, so we had we had plenty of courts. That was, that was fine, and uh, and that was the plan. I mean, the plan was to go up there, right. and just to <clears throat> kind of get immersed in the Stowe method. And I'll never forget the first time I got up there. Um, he had me because Tom could no longer rally or hit the balls, or right. So he had me hit with one of the guys, and of course, you know, trying to hit with one of the other guys. They're just eating me up with these balls, and I'm just fighting everything off. And after a couple of minutes, you just stop, 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 stop. And I'm going, oh crap! Oh, <laughs> get man. get your keys, I'm get out. For, I'm here for two minutes, and he's going to send me home. And he came over to me, and he was very honest. He just said, "Look, um, I'm just going to give you, I'm just going to give you the truth here." He says, "You really have nothing in your game that I can build on." So if you you really have no foundation, turn racket back, hit in front, and follow through. Right. You have nothing that I can build on, and so it's up to you right now. If you if if you want to keep going, then you're going to have to do precisely what I tell you to do. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and I said a thought for a second, and I just said, "Well, what have I got to lose? I mean, I already suck, right?" <laughs> I can't. I can't beat my way out of a wet paper towel, right? With the game I've got, my students aren't getting any better. So, I said, "Fine." I said, "Your, your fine. Shawshank, your Shawshank moment." That's right. <laughs> start, start crawling, baby. Start crawling through the muck. So I just said, "Fine," and he was, you know, that time with him was was really interesting. I was there for eighteen months, and. Um, Really, in the beginning, I was just total fish out of water. I really had no idea what the language meant, um, but I started seeing how it how it um, how it fit into Doug King, Steve Stefanski, and John Hubble's games. Even though those three guys look completely different as players, right, 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 right. There were they there or there were these common elements, and so. You know, I, I started to kind of sense this is this is the way that he's pointing me, and you know, if I can figure out his language and figure out what he's trying to show me, then uh, you know, again, I got nothing to lose. So my my answer was yes, sir. Whatever you say, I'm all yours. And it was so <laughs> funny because you know I'd play like crap for three hours. I couldn't hit a ball for three hours, and then we and then we'd be picking up balls at the end. And he'd, he'd kind of, he'd, he'd, I'd be sort of depressed and, and he'd kind of come up to me. He says, he said, uh, Brent, and, you know, away from the other guys, he just said, I, I got to tell you. Um, and I'm thinking, oh my God, you know, this is it, you know. Yeah, I, I, you know, I don't <laughs> think this is working out. 
<laughs> and he would say, he would say, I got to tell you, you're one of the best athletes I have ever coached. Wow. And, and he's and he's looking at you with these eyes, and and you're just like me. <laughs> you, talk, you talking to me? <laughs> I mean, the guy that couldn't hit the ball for the last three hours. He said, "You're one of the best athletes I've ever coached, and I'm telling you, if you stick with this, you're going to become a really good tennis player." Well, I was picking up balls like crazy, right? I was just running around, <laughs> sprinting about, picking up balls, and then you know, like a minute later. I'm so fired up. I'm pumped up. And we are, we're all sitting down on the bench, gathering up our gear, putting stuff away. And I'm just, you know, I'm on cloud nine. And I stand <laughs> up and I say, all right, well, same time next week, Mr. Stowe. And he looked at me and we go, he go, all right, we'll try it again. <laughs> I went, what? I <laughs> hear there. Oh well, yeah. So, um, Anyway, that's that was kind of the plan with him, and and uh, and that's how I got started with with Mr. Stowe. <clears throat> so so you said you had eighteen months. Yeah. Of that uh, of that experience, being being in the mix there, and and being able to glean, you know, not just from Tom, but also from you know Steve and and Doug and John. Um, you know, there's a lot to glean there when you're in that kind of environment. You know, you get you get great. Um, there's so much to just visually pick up on. And also, you know, when you listen to the better players talk, there's also a certain cadence, a certain talk that they talk, you know, that, um, so, so along that journey in the fit in the 18 months, then was there like how many, like, was there a major conflict along the way? Was there something in there that totally, that, totally. I mean, there were, there were several conflicts. Um, I misunderstood some of the stuff he was telling me. And so I'd go after the, the, the sessions, the Wednesday morning sessions with him, I'd go back at the Berkeley Tennis Club and try to implement what I thought he was teaching yeah. me. And, and my perception was one thing, and yet the reality of what I was now doing off the teaching court with him was right. completely different. I mean, it was basically, you know, he, Mr. Stowe was a, a flat ball hitting ground stroke kind of guy he he did talk about top spin and up spin, but it was a semi top. But man, I was taking liberties with stuff in terms of um, balls were just flying all over the zip code. I mean, you know, <laughs> and and I just wasn't getting, I wasn't getting certain pieces of it, and it wasn't wasn't totally my fault. wasn't uh, Some of it was, again, he was he was at the end of his life. He was not wasn't healthy, he got frustrated easily, didn't, didn't articulate stuff as well, wasn't as patient. And um, so, uh, but still, I, I was taking liberties with some of the stuff. And because I was seeing these three guys and the level they were at, and not only could I see what they were doing in practice, but I watched them go out and play matches, and I go, my God, I just want that so bad. <laughs> I want to be like that so bad that I just forced it. I forced it over and over. And I didn't go through my learning process of trying to develop my own unique feel for what Mr. Stowe was giving me. Not trying to be just like Kinger or just like Stefan right. or just like Hubs, but taking what the foundation that they had and 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 really sort of taking those things and trying to trying to create my own. I didn't trust. I didn't trust that I could have a unique, a unique style, with with the uh, with the uh, Stowe found, uh, you know, the, with the uh, Stowe fundamentals. So, I think I wasted a lot of time trying to overplay and overdo it and try to get right. it too fast. And uh, so there was a day, just about almost into the eighteen months of, of being with Tom, where at the Berkeley Tennis Club. He has since passed away, but a guy named Bill, Bill Crosby, and Bill Crosby was Tom's assistant uh, back in the 40s and 50s, a guy who became number one in the country in doubles with Bobby Perez back in the, like, 1960. Uh, Bill Crosby was an unbelievable doubles player uh, in terms of the Stowe technique stuff. And then one day, 
he saw me out there just launching balls all over court four at the Berkeley Tennis Club. And <laughs> he's walking from the back courts just, you know, very calm. And he, he, he sees a break in the action. He, he, he says, Brent, uh, gosh, you've been working so so hard with, with Tom. And I'm, I'm, I'm so happy and I'm so pleased because I can see so much uh, difference in your game. And I said, yeah, but, you know, I'm just kind of flying the ball everywhere. And he says, you know, you're at a point now where you just need to do two things. And I'm going, okay, man, <laughs> what are they? I'm ready. Just give them to me. <laughs> he says, you visually got to find the ball. Just got to find it. And, and I said, you mean like watch the ball? And he said, well, ha however you want to say it. But you've got to be able to make really good visual contact with the tennis ball, whether it's after the ball's left your racket or whether it's coming at you. You know, you right. can't be distracted with thoughts or swing thoughts or any of this kind of stuff. Windy day, blah, blah. He just said, you got to find the ball. And I said, okay. I said, what's the next thing? He says, and then you just got to, you just got to decide where you want to send it. <laughs> right. And I'm going, well, I mean, is that, that's it? And I, I, I think I said to him, I said, you know, is that it? And he said, he said, that's it. He said, you know, if, if you continue to try to manufacture the Stowe stuff, right. you're, you're just not going to be able to learn how to play the game. And, and so for me, that was, a, uh, that was a big hurdle for me to get over the conflicts that I had uh, when I was going through that 18 months with Tom. Great piece of wisdom. Yeah, it was, for sure. Great piece of wisdom. Um, okay, so uh, so what? Um, so you've gone through the eighteen months. You get this great piece of wisdom, and and now you're going to go out there and play. Is there some? Is there like the like um, like the highlight, the moment, right? That that resulted from. Yeah, the highlight um, for me happened really quickly, which I was shocked. I was totally shocked. Um, Tom passed away in 1983, so I had those 18 months, 81, part of 82, and then he got just super sick, and, and he passed away in 1983. The very next year, in 1984, I played the the National 35 hard courts, in which were then in Mill Valley. I think I lost pretty early in the singles, and my partner and I, Rob Olson, were unseated in the doubles, and the doubles was a full draw 64, no buys, wow. um, which was, you know, which was a, a big tournament. And we were unseeded. And we had to play number one or the number five seeds in the first round. And um, we knew these guys. They're from Northern California. And uh, Robbie was a little upset because one of the guys who were playing over there had done the seeds and had decided <laughs> that we shouldn't be seeded. So, and they, I don't know, I don't know that we should have been. But anyway, so Robbie decided to take it out on this guy. And you know, Rob could. Rob could poach. He had a real knack for poaching and had a big <laughs> overhead. And this guy was bailing out often during this match. <laughs> we went right through them three and two. And then, you know, we played a couple more rounds of guys who were not seated um, and got through those matches. And then in the quarters we played, uh, who at the time had never been beaten, nor Cal, John, John Levin and Charlie Hovler. And they were, they were mm -hmm. legendary. Yeah. <clears throat> great team. Oh, yeah. great team. And and we got into a dogfight with those guys and snuck out with uh, a third set victory. Nice. Like at 6-3 or something like this. And now all of a sudden we're in the semifinals. I'm looking at, I'm going, how how do we get here? <laughs> how do we get here? And Robbie's going, I don't know, but we got to play this other team that was seated, I think, two or something. Or maybe they were one. I can't remember the next day. And uh, Gene Malin, who was uh, a great player, I think he played at USC, and he played in the tour, and he won the singles that year in the finals, 0-0. Oh, no. And so... <laughs> Ouch. Ouchie. So we're playing him in doubles, and another guy from Australia who'd, who'd sniffed... Uh, he'd played a little bit, maybe he's just a practice partner in the, on the Australian Davis Cup for a couple of years, this guy, Dougie Smith. And, uh, and we ended up splitting sets with those guys because they were up a set and a break, and uh, one of them shall remain nameless, which one, but decided that they'll just kind of goof around and look cool and hit a few balls. And we end up breaking their serve. And we win the second set. 
and we're a little pissed that they kind of right. did that. We blow them out in the third. Just blow them out. It was like 6-1. They didn't know what hit them. We didn't either. <laughs> and, uh, and, then, and then we get in the finals, and um, we play the number three seed team, Steve Cornell and Dennis Trout in the finals. Really Another good team. great team. Yeah, really great team. And, and, um, <laughs> and so we, we start out, and we, we're, we're just on a roll. I mean, it's like we're playing with house money, right? We're unseated. Right. These guys are seated three. And we figure, what do we got? We got nothing to lose. And so we go out and we win the first set 6-1. I mean, the ball is like. <laughs> looks like a beach ball, right? It's coming it's like... over. It's coming over. And I'm just, you know, and, you know, a couple of lucky let cords, let's be honest. Um, you know, but we win the first set 6-1. And then we change sides in the second. We just break them to go up. Me serving at 5-2 in the second. We're sitting down and. Uh, and Robbie just kind of taps me, and he goes, Man, we're going to win a goal ball. And I, oh. said, <laughs> I said, you shut up. You just shut up about that. We haven't done anything yet. Come on. He goes, okay, man, all right, all right whatever. So I'm serving. We work it to 40-15. And uh, I'm just I'm serving so well, and I just I hit another good first serve to Dennis kind of jam him up in here and he fluffs up this little short lob to Rob and you know Rob really I mean I'm telling you world class overhead he could really spank it it was loud and I see it and it's like I've got the sword I'm putting it away knowing that it's over <laughs> and Robbie gets a little little anxious and tight on it hits it firm but it goes literally in the bottom of the net ouch yeah and he turns around and goes eh, you know yeah, big deal. And I'm going, all right, all right. 40-30. I served, still, you know, it's match point. I served to Steve. Steve. Same thing. I hit a really good first serve, tie him up, nurse short lob to Rob. I'm thinking, well, he's not going to miss this one. <laughs> I swear to God, Jeff, he hits it off the back of the fence on the fly. <laughs> he's just turned into the tightest snare drum of all time. And he turns around, and he looks at me with this look of horror that, oh, my God, I think I jinxed it on the side change when I told you. Right. You know, we're going to have, we're going to win the gold ball. So, um, I, you know, I'm thinking, you idiot. So, Deuce, I serve out wide to Dennis. He barely gets his racket on it, tips it, but there's it's not coming back. And Robbie turns around and looks at me and goes, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and now it's match point again. I serve to Steve, and Steve is no dummy on this thing. He takes his return and just plays it straight back at Rob. Rob's first volley, ah, plays it back. Steve goes, okay, plays another one. Robbie, ah, like this. And they go about through three or four, ah, ah. And I'm over there just going, wow. And so finally Steve misses, you know, ball in the net. And uh, and here we are. You know, we've just won um, a national doubles title. And, uh, you know, the first thing I wanted to do was, was it was bittersweet. I mean, I was really excited. I didn't want to call my dad. I didn't want to call my mom. I didn't want to call anyone. All I wanted to do was call Mr. Tom Stowe. Yeah. And I couldn't do it. I could not do it. And it was, it, like I said, it was bittersweet. And, and so that was the result that I got from him, which happened pretty quickly. And when I sort of reflected on it afterwards, I, I realized that the way I played throughout that whole tournament was a culmination of the 18 months with him and then kind of another maybe year without him sort of taking Mr. Crosby's advice of just, right. just find the ball and decide where you want to hit it. And so, um, uh, and, I, and I guess the real, I mean, that was great to kind of, to kind of get that result. You know, and right. back, back then, it's so different now, they have these, back then they had this tiny little box wood box <laughs> tiny i mean you can't even see it and this little you know gold ball cherished it but the thing i took away from that really was um it, it was great to have the result and sort of the notoriety but for me internally the transformation for me from thinking that i wanted to be known as as one of the fellas 
completely went away because what I got from that experience was how appreciative and grateful and thankful I was that I had the chance to work with, with Mr. Stowe. And that to this day, whenever I share this story, whether it's one-on-one -on -one with you or, or anyone else, whether it's in a group, I say that um, the most important thing is that, is that if there's been some person in your life, and it doesn't have to be in tennis, right. but some person, could be a mom, could be a dad, could be a cousin, could be an uncle, could be an aunt, could be a Tom Stowe, it could be someone else, a mentor who came along and gave you this thing that you could not do on your own, that you need to call that person today. <laughs> you need to Pony Express, mail, text, and if they're not around, you need to call their spouse or their family and let them know just how much they meant to you. And that was the, that was the big takeaway for me. That was my big transformation was that feeling. And to this day, the one thing that I really want to make sure I do if someone's helped me, even in a tiny way, I want to make sure that they get full credit for it. I don't, I don't ever want to be a do-it-yourselfer ever right. again. So, so yeah. Awesome. Yeah, man. Well, that, that's great. That's a great journey. <laughs> well, it was. You know, I look back on it, and it was. Uh, it's sort of a classic. You know, zero to, you know, I'd say hero, but zero to a different place, which right. I really didn't see it coming. And so some of it is we have to sometimes just put the blinders on because there were times when I was launching balls all over the Berkeley Tennis Club. I would have guys come up to me and say, are you really sure that this is what you want to do, that you want to keep doing this with your game? I mean, I was losing <laughs> the guys who I'd never, ever lost to before at the Berkeley right. Tennis Club. And I would, I'd say, oh, yeah, yeah. And, the, you know, in the back of my mind, I was going, I'm not sure. But there was this other thing just said, just look, just just keep going. Just keep <laughs> going. Just just keep driving up to Napa every, every every Wednesday. Don't be late. Be on time. And do That's right. Ex Don't be late. <laughs> do exactly what Mr. Stowe says to do. And, and yeah. uh, um, there's, there's another quick story I've got about working with him. He was really big on on having ground strokes that would produce short balls that would give you an opportunity for an approach shot. There was one day when he must have hand fed me a hundred balls to my forehand that were right around, you know, three feet behind the service line, and he wanted me to perform a certain stroke technique, take it on the rise, top of the bounce, flat up the line, and move in. And after about 60 of them, I just said, um, okay, this is great. When are we going to get to the advanced stuff? <laughs> <laughs> and that's when he shot me. <laughs> and that's when he considered very strongly just going, there's the gate, there's, there's your the car, gate. don't ever come back again. And uh, I think he might have done that. All right, 10, 9, 8. eight. And he finally right. got down to zero, and he said, this is the advanced stuff. Until you master the fundamentals, you will never, ever own the, the advanced right. stuff. And so the takeaway for me was that, oh, so there is really no advanced stuff that's different than the fundamentals. The, the fundamentals, when you master them, become the advanced stuff. Right. And and that was sort of right. That all for me kind of culminated in that in, in, in 1984 at that tournament was I'd, I'd mastered enough of the fundamentals in doubles, maybe not in singles, but but in doubles right. to where um, we could beat a lot of good teams and uh, and win that gold ball. Yeah, there's no predicting when when your you know your aha moments happen right because um, they can happen under any sorry it could be you know on the windy blustery day it could be like you said you lost early in singles but somehow you know you and your doubles partner had the energy that week and it and just it, you know everything lined up and there you go you know um well i think uh the takeaway for anyone who's listening to this who who really wants to 
become a better player. Takeaway for me is to stop doing it by, stop trying to figure it out on your own. Right. Find somebody who's going to give you foundational technique, but is not going to turn your lesson time with, with them into an annuity in terms of trying to perfect stroke technique, but, but someone, a, a teaching pro or a coach who will help you actually reduce stroke technique so it becomes repeatable and then teach you what are the shot patterns, what are the plays right. that actually win matches um, not only at your current skill level, but in the next level up. Right. And, and once you find that person, you're just going to have to assume that there's going to be some, some super conflict. There's going to be some stress and some stuff that doesn't make sense. And you may have the instinct to go, well, either this guy is not right for me or, and I'll, I'll go back to trying to figure it out for myself, or right. I'm going to go down the street and find someone else. And, and, and once you do that, you're, you're in a world of, of hurt because, because you need to get a consistent message. And, right. And, you know, so you got to be really smart about, about who you start spending your money with. And with Mr. Stowe, he already had built in credibility because back in the day, he'd, he'd won the NCAA doubles in 1925 with Bud Chandler. He had already coached Don Budge. Um, oh, and, and he was okay. <laughs> who was not too bad during his Grand Slam year of 1938. Uh, Budge already had the great backhand, but but Mr. Stowe gave him the forehand and gave him um, some shot patterns and strategies and tactics where Budge became a different player. So he already, for me, had the credibility uh, not only as a player, but also as a coach. So I knew that when he asked me the question, well, you, you know, the choice now is you don't have anything I can build on, so it's up to you. What do you want to do? And I just figured, yeah, let's go. Let's start let's building. Go. So <laughs> you got to find the right person, which might take some time. It's, it wouldn't be unusual to go out there and experiment with a couple of different pros yeah. to find out the ones who were just spinning BS are the ones who actually know what they're talking about. And anyone who's saying, well, you know, we've got to get you a Rafa-like topspin forehand, they're not your guy. I don't care how well they played in college or if they played in the tour. If they're a young buck, they're 30 years old, and they've not made it on the tour, and they're now teaching. If, 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 if that's what they're trying to do with you, um, my advice is that's not the right person that's going to help you help right. you understand the game. So find that right person and then go through the Shawshank all day. Shawshank, uh, what was it Shawshank all day or something? Shawshank all, all day, Shawshank, every day. All day. All Shawshank um, all day. And there's going to be, there's going to be um, a period there where, where you're crawling through the muck and you're going to question yourself. And if you stick with it, you will come out the other end. Um, no one knows when, no one knows what the epiphany right. will be, but it will happen. And and then once you do it, hopefully what your transformation will be will be a lot like mine, which is you'll be so grateful for this person that helped you get to where you are that you're going to want to tell the world every time you get to talk about, you know, how you made your transition right. from from not so good to good. Right. <laughs> So that's my story. <clears throat> it's a good story. <laughs> well, it's it's my story, man. I mean, I'm not going to, um, I don't know how else to spin it other than that's what happened to me. And and I think if, if uh, and we're going to do your story next for the people. Um, everyone's got a story. I don't care who you are. I don't care yeah. how you got to where you are. There's there's a story, and it sort of follows along the whole storyline of of what we just went through. You know, all 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 those questions you asked me, Jeff. So good interview, man. Guys, if this resonated with you, if you want to jump on a short little ten minute coaching call with us, 
or just one of us, just with me or with Jeff, or, the, or, or the, we can do a three three way call here. We'd love to do it. Ten minutes, it's free, but you got to come armed to that call with the number one thing that you have not been able to figure out in your game, and we uh, will hopefully try to point you in the right direction. Uh, Jeff, anything else? Any other words of wisdom from you, man? Fundamentals. <laughs> Boom. Boom. Guys, get out there making another great day, and uh, we're going to do something again like this tomorrow. Can't wait.